for coming. Good to see you. Um, I'm an environmental psychologist. So when I sort of started looking at this problem, I looked at it from the traditional environmental psychology perspective for a moment. Uh, I study climate change, particularly how do you motivate people to do the things that they <coughs> need to do to try to protect our planet in this climate crisis that we have. But the question that we are all posed was what makes people become environmentally conscious? I thought about that for quite a while, but I started realizing that for me that question is problematic. Um, the idea that we need to become conscious and that will bring us together and will allow us to create climate action that will protect the planet is problematic because it assumes a question. It assumes the question of what brings us together. I actually want to sort of take a different jumping off point and not ask what brings us together, but actually to ask what keeps us apart. And I think to the extent we can answer that question, then the things that we really want to do about bringing people together will sort of work themselves out to some extent. So let me sort of tell you what I mean. Um, I would argue, based on the idea of what keeps people apart, that there are really three important points if you want to bring people together to create climate action. You need to connect, you need to accept, and you need to grow. I would argue that these three are to some extent the antithesis of what our culture teaches us to do. So point number one, if you want to create climate change, I would suggest that you encourage connection rather than disconnection. We live in this society that is teaching us to be disconnected from the moment that we're born. We're taken, we're put off in a crib in a nursery somewhere by ourselves, oftentimes. We're taught growing up that we're individuals over and over and over again. We're sort of learning that self-interest is what motivates people to some extent. These are messages that culture may give us, but what they actually end up doing is promoting psychological or actual physical disconnection from other people, from other social groups, and from nature itself. So, Part of the thing is, is that this fosters a belief when we're disconnected that disconnection is inherent. That belief actually divides us and to some extent conquers us too. It sets us on the course of isolation and loneliness. It dissipates our resources, our time, our energy, our money on pursuits that are not necessarily uh, fostering and bettering our lives. Um, it leaves us ripe for things like exploitation, inequality, and justice when we're disconnected from each other, when we're disconnected from nature. The trick is, even in psychology, we build this myth of being individuals and being sort of self-interested into our theory. And then we go and we develop sort of strategies for changing behavior that focus on personal change for collective level problems as if we, as an individual, necessarily are the sole cause of a collective group level problem. The thing that we've learned from social neuroscience is that people are not generally wired to disconnect. We're actually wired to connect. And if we're wired to connect but we're not connecting, it raises the question why. And this is one of the questions I've been asking for a number of years. If people are, are wired to connect with people and nature from the start, then this is a very different starting point. How did we get to where we're so disconnected from each other? It turns out that if you look at neuro social neuroscience, there are three big findings. We find pleasure in being connected. We spend time thinking about others, often even in our free time. And we shape our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors to the groups that we're a part of. Psychology has this idea that we're individuals who need to be taught to be group members. I would argue the opposite. We're group members who are taught to be individuals. And that's not a cultural universal. We learn this lesson so well that we fail to realize that we act like individuals together. We might have a bunch of different colored t-shirts, but then we're wearing t-shirts. <laughs> right? So, my, part of my message is, if you want to address climate change, we have to resist this temptation to disconnect. To disconnect in our thoughts, seeing ourselves as fundamentally separate, 
from disconnecting in our feelings when we promote divisive feelings like fear or anger. And in our behaviors, we need to stand together, not apart. And if we actually seek genuine connections with people in nature, we are talking about not only now, but across generations, it turns out that those genuine connections are part of what we need. Whether it's the warmth of human touch, whether it's the feet walking on grass without your shoes, there's something different about connection. We're wired to experience that. Point number two, if you want to promote climate action, you need to encourage acceptance, not rejection. And in our society today, this seems to have gotten much harder to do as people are increasingly, increasingly polarized. Society becomes polarized on all kinds of grounds, especially political, and then we stop listening. We stop talking, and we start attacking that other side as being thoughtless or lazy or biased, or even evil because they don't think, feel, and behave the way we do. It turns out, of course, that when people are not acting like we do, we might set aside our compassion and understanding. We think the facts should speak for themselves, and that people don't view the, the facts the way we do, they must have a distorted reality, rather than the accurate one we have. Well, the thing is, is that part of the trick is, as a scientist, I can assure you that science isn't always on the side of social change. It isn't always progressive. Science isn't necessarily giving us facts that have, that have an inherent meaning that everyone will understand. And it turns out that facts don't plainly speak for themselves. They're filtered through the lens of our social group memberships, whether we realize them or not. And the thing is, is that still many times we're overcome by this idea, this need to be right, or fraught with these emotions of disconnection again. If we're that way, we tend to opt for rejection rather than acceptance of the differences between groups. We've created a model of social change to try to understand how new prejudices arise in society and how they sort of go away. This has been a question I've sort of been interested in for a decade now. And one thing that we realized from, from the work we've done is that human experiences of reality are very diverse. They're also incomplete. And it turns out that many of them are truthful. Notice I didn't say accurate. Social groups have different views of reality because we're all sitting around this fire that we call life. And when you sit on one side of the fire, you see life a little bit differently than someone sitting on the other side of the fire. It turns out, of course, that we might become convinced that our view from our side of the fire is the right one. And thus, by default, maybe the other side of the fire is wrong. The trouble is, of course, is that we see incomplete views of the fire from our different sides. Those incomplete views could be honest, they could be truthful, they could contribute to dialogue, uh, but that could be true even if they're not accurate from any given particular side of the fire. I think part of the trick is that we need to understand that reality is a plural thing. There are lots of different ways to see reality. and Together, hopefully, part of those can be put together to understand a little better. It turns out, of course, when it comes to climate change, we have to recognize that these different social identities are not just obstacles that we have to overcome, but they're resources that we can harness to promote climate action. But we have to accept and work with differences in a democratic way. We can't try to stomp them out or use rejection to marginalize alternative identities. That's not going to get us anywhere, or at least it's not going to get us there in the way we might hope. Now, point three, we have to encourage growth, not stagnation. So I'm a psychologist, and I teach interventions to socially influence people to do all kinds of behavior change stuff. And one of the things I've sort of learned over the years is that this model of individual psychology suggests various techniques for manipulating people to do what we want them to do. The problem is, is when we use these, they actually favor certain groups over others. They promote rewards and punishments that have no inherent meaning to other groups. And they tend to stoke divisive emotions like anger, fear, or even shame. And when you do that, 
when you disrespect or threaten other identities, you'll just encourage people to resist them, resist your influence, and it will actually generate the inflexibility that you presuppose in other people. It turns out, of course, if you want to, to sort of influence people, it's better to promote their motivation to what we call transcend, or to change their situation, rather than promoting behaviors to protect the status quo. Sometimes we create what we don't want. We need to realize that people are only as inflexible as their perceptions of the relationships around them. We've been doing a lot of fun studies on norm change, and one of the things that sort of comes out of some of those studies is that, for instance, if you look at levels of prejudice, they increase during times of perceived stability. They decrease in times of instability in our studies, which I find fascinating, at least explicit level biases. What that tells me is that our perceptions of the world are grounded in the relationships we have with others, and when we see them changing, it changes sort of the way we view the world. So when perceptions change, people are more open to social change. It turns out there are some really fun studies by some friends I know who have shown that even the staunchest conservatives have been fighting for, in their studies, climate action, because they perceived it as a way to maintain stability of the things they cared about. There are ways to use identities. So our work suggests really two sort of important avenues then for climate action in this regard. Provide people with alternative identities or visions for what that identity could be. Give them an alternative. And then encourage support for these alternatives in the real world. Help them happen. People act upon the identities they've adopted in the course of their lives. If they're not acting sustainably, it's not like they're not acting. So the thing is, we need to figure out how to provide alternative visions for them or identities they can use. They might not be your, your uh, future tiny house resident. They might not be geeked about voluntary simplicity. They're probably not going to chain themselves to an oil rig. But are there other identities that they could use that would promote sustainable behavior anyway, even if they don't do it for the reasons that some of us wish they would? Why do we care, as I say as an environmental psychologist, why people do stuff as long as they do what they need to do? So there may be other identities that allow them to act sustainably, and that may be worth thinking about. They may, we found in our studies that if you can promote identities that make people feel proud for the good things we've done, that motivates them to change. If you can make them feel guilty for the things we've done, that can promote change. Don't promote guilt for what they personally have done unless they hug trees. It will fail. <laughs> so it turns out either way, uh, if we can use these emotions of connection, we might help get people to do stuff. It also turns out that you can, if you can generate support for these alternative identities through strong leadership, you can get people to be more willing to change. Leadership is not about standing out. It's stand, about standing with. Leaders are not loners. Leaders lead. They lead in a complex relationship with their followers. They're helping groups to enact this alternative vision. We cre completed a study with um, Pope Francis's eco-leadership that sort of demonstrates the complexities of, of leadership. So we did a study where Pope Francis's messages on the environment or on poverty were given to Catholic participants. And we did that in the context of making Catholic participants think about themselves as being more religious. How are you like your religious friends? They'll write all kinds of things. Or think themselves as more secular, and they'll write all kinds of things too. And it turns out that when you do that, before a thing called the presidential election, it turns out that secular Catholics People who thought of themselves as more secular, not that they just were, they didn't want to do anything. They were like, the Pope's message is, leave me alone, Pope, quit bothering me, Give, go, you bring me back to poverty or whatever. I, I don't do that other thing. But then a thing called an election happened. And then the secular uh, people were reduced to think of themselves as secular. They heard the Pope's messages and said, let me do everything. 
yes, I will recycle, I'll control my solid waste, I'll conserve water, and I'll conserve energy, I'll even advocate, I'll do all these kinds of behaviors after the election, but not before. Folks who are induced to think of themselves as religious Catholics, no change, no matter what we did. Other than we strengthen their faith, but that's, you know, that's okay. That's what we're looking at for. So, what does this mean? Eco-leadership is complex. And so, when we're bringing uh, ourselves into a leadership role to try to make change, we have to understand not just us as a leader and followers will follow, we need to understand the followers and actually lead them. Which means we need to understand the identities we're working with and try to help them to promote change from the identities that exist. So anyway, if there's three things you can take away, connect, accept, and grow. If we can do that, I think we have a better chance at promoting the kind of behavior change we hope to see. So, thank you.